Only there should be no needy one translated here. Often it's translated poor. There shall be no poor among you. The Hebrew word is evion, okay? For Yehovah does greatly bless you in the land which Yehovah your Elohim is giving you to possess as an inheritance. And before we go through these things in Deuteronomy, I want to uh, define a few words for you because then when we encounter them in the passage, we'll understand what it's really saying. Okay, there should be no poor among you. Well, kind of what we've got as our conception of who the poor is, is it's the needy. Okay, so maybe poor would be okay in this case, but it, it says evyon. The word is evyon. And when we come across Hebrew words, for the purposes of this anyway, there are three types of Hebrew words that we need to know. Okay, there are verbs. And from verbs, which is the action being done, okay, you get <coughs> nouns, which are the names of things or people that do the thing that the verb is. And you have adjectives as well. And an adjective is a description. And it's a description describing something as something that does the verb, basically. So this is an adjective. Evion is an adjective. And the outline of biblical usage has it as in want, needy, chiefly poor, or needy person. And that's kind of good enough for us to get a grasp of what's being said. It's somebody with a need, somebody who is lacking. Psalm 112, 4 to 9 says, Light has risen in the darkness to the straight ones, those showing favor, the compassionate, and the righteous. Okay, so these are the sort of things that Yeshua is drawing upon when he's speaking. Good is a man showing favor and lending. He sustains his matters in judgment, for he is never shaken. The righteous is remembered forever. He is not afraid of an evil report. His heart is steadfast, trusting in Yehovah. Okay, so we've got all the scriptures that say if you lend to a poor man, then Yehovah will pay you back. This person, they're not afraid. Okay, they know that if they're doing all of these things, then Yehovah is going to be right there for them. His heart is upheld. He is not afraid when he looks on his adversaries. He scattered the broad. He gave to the Evion. His righteousness is standing forever. His horn is exalted with esteem. So this is an example where Evion is used. Okay. Our English translations are terrible for understanding what's being said. He gives to the poor. Yeah, you can kind of understand it in the case of Evion. Exodus 23, 10 to 11 says, And for six years you are to sow your land and shall gather its increase. For the seventh year you are to let it rest and shall leave it. And the Evion of your people shall eat to the needy ones of the people who are to come uh, in the seventh year. In the Sabbath year the needy come and they eat of uh, what grows in the field. Deuteronomy 24 verse 14 says, Do not oppress a hired servant who is a knee, which we'll get to, and needy, evion. Okay, so these two words are independently translated as poor, but obviously it can't say poor and poor here, because that wouldn't really make much sense to us, although that is essentially what they do by translating these words as poor elsewhere. Uh, of your brothers or of the strangers. Okay, so anyone who's a needy of your own and anyone who is a knee. And a knee is an interesting word. Okay, so a knee is another adjective. It's a word to describe the state of being, perhaps. In the outline of biblical usage, it's got someone who is poor, afflicted, humble, or wretched. But that's not really what this word means. Okay, to understand what the adjective means, we need to understand what the verb means means that the adjective is describing something that is doing that action. And that verb is here, okay, H6031. And that is the word anna. This is a verb, okay, and this is what it means. Okay, it's from, it's a primitive root, and it carries the idea of looking down upon or browbeating somebody. To be put down, become low, to be depressed, be downcast, to be afflicted. Okay, and really, as I was looking through the context that this word is used in, the word that came to my mind was unfortunate. And I will show you why that's a good word. Don't use the word unfortunately, because we don't believe in fortune, we don't believe in luck. But 
the word unfortunate carries a different signified. You, can, you know what someone who is unfortunate is. It's got nothing to do with fortune and luck, but we can understand unfortunate. Uh, 2 Samuel 22, 28 uses this word. It says, you save the Yeni, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. Okay, so these are the unfortunate, the, those who are kind of desolate, desperate people. Uh, don't worry about what it translates it as because the translations are often no good. Just have the word ani in your, in your mind. I mean, as you're going through the scriptures, when you come across the word poor, go to uh, blueletterbible.org, type in the verse, look at the Hebrew that's behind it or the Greek that's behind it and see what word it is. I'm only going to go through the Hebrew today, but the Greek, there's an incredible wealth of words as well. Okay, you saved the ani, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. Uh, Job 29.12 says, Because I rescued the Ani who cried out and the fatherless who had no helper. And this is part of being Ani, being one of the Ani, to have no one to help, basically. And this reminds me very much of the position that I was in before I came to Yah. I'd had an experience. Uh, I used to hang around with a group of maybe like 40, 50 people. We used to uh, be a very popular person and we'd all hang out together. But I had an experience where uh, I took LSD once. I didn't just take LSD though, I also took a substance called methadone, not methadone, which is an opiate um, substitute. Methadone, which is an amphetamine. If anyone knows anything about amphetamines, they tend to paranoia. And this was a very, very strong amphetamine, like crystal meth or something like that, and it, it tends to extreme paranoia. So whilst under the influence of methadone, I also took a large dose of LSD, which is, you know, a hallucinogenic. And I had an experience where, well, first of all, I had gone to sleep, and when I woke up in this state, everything was orange. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't have any kind of grasp on anything in the physical world at all. And so to my mind, you know, waking up into this state that, you know, everything was gone basically. I had nothing left in the world at all. Um, I'd gone insane uh, and I had no kind of uh, recognition that I would ever come back from this because it was such a, a strong thing that was happening. I remember wandering into the room that was next door and all of my friends were in there and with this extreme paranoia, I thought that they were all like really dead set against me, like really, really strongly against me. And because I was on a hallucinogenic, I could see them saying things about me and to me that were just, you know, uh, really, really bad. So I thought, everyone hates me. I've gone completely insane. There's, there's nothing in this world. I thought, I'm going to end up in a mental asylum. That's what's going to be next. I thought, this is my one opportunity where I can kill myself. Because if I don't kill myself right now and end this experience, I'm going to end up restrained in a mental facility and uh, I'm never going to have that opportunity again. And to my mind at that point, death wasn't anything to be afraid of. When you died, you would just go on to the next conscious experience. We were consciousness in physical bodies, and when your physical body died, your consciousness would be free to go on to experience whatever it was going to experience next. So the thought held absolutely no fear for me. It was just a logical choice. I was like, well, this experience has come to an end. There's nothing good to be gained here. This is only going to go downhill to misery from here, so I'm going to kill myself. I remember announcing that I was going to go and kill myself and that it was, it was okay. It maybe make an explanation. But from that point onwards, the way that people looked at me completely changed. I don't know whether it was the residuals of the paranoia or what it was coming down off the drugs. My experience of life was completely different from that point. It had completely changed. Um, and I didn't have touch with people, didn't make touch with people anymore, get in touch with people. People didn't get in touch with me and I was living in a house. I was on my own. It was a very, very dark, dark period of time. So I was very much in the position of the Ani, those who are desperate and unfortunate. And I can remember, I didn't know what I was crying out to, what I was 
praying to. I don't even know if I thought that I was praying or whatever it was, but I was very much uh, in this position. Uh, so this resonates with me. I rescued the Ani who cried out, the fatherless who had no helper. This was the position that I was in when Yehovah rescued me. Psalm 72 verse 12 says, He delivers the Avyon, the needy, when he cries out, and the Ani who has no helper. So again, we see from the context that this is used in, that these are the people that Yehovah has a heart for, the people who the world is looking down on, the people who are browbeaten by the world people who don't have anyone else in the world you know you think of people who are unfortunate in life you see people who are uh, you know they perhaps they've got mental health issues or you know uh, they've got whatever going on they're not necessarily needy they've not necessarily got any not got any money but they're desperate and they're unfortunate people these are the people who are truly being identified in this so poor is really not a good translation Proverbs 15, 15 says, All the days of the Ani are evil, but gladness of heart is a continual feast. Again, I can resonate with this because this is what Yehovah took me from and what he took me to. The two sides of this. Psalm 10, verse 2 says, In arrogance, <coughs> the wrongdoer hotly pursues the Ani. Okay, so this... This whole um, scripture in Psalm 10, we're going to look at um, what's going on in this. But it's talking about the wrongdoer, the evil one, who goes after those who are desperate or the unfortunate in society. They're caught by the schemes which they are devised. You know, perhaps they've not got the toolkit of social tools to use with people. Okay, so people take advantage of them. Now, this word is one that we need to understand. This, uh, this word is only used in Psalm 10, but it gives us so much more depth of understanding about who the Ani are. Okay, and this word is the chleka. Okay, it's an adjective, it's a description, and it's a hapless, poor, unfortunate person. I'd not come across this word when the word unfortunate came to mind, but the chleka is very much used as a description of the Ani, that they're hapless, they're poor, they're unfortunate. Yeah, it says here, uh, from an unused root, probably meaning to be dark or figuratively to be unhappy, a wretch, unfortunate, poor. So hold that in your mind, this idea of being dark when you read in Psalm 10 when this word is used. Okay, so Psalm 10 verse 8 says, he sits, this is the wrongdoer who is preying on the Ani. He sits in the hiding places of the villages. In the secret places he murders the innocents. His eyes are on the lookout for their chaleka. He lies in wait in the secret place. As a lion in his den, he lies in wait to catch the ani. He catches the poor, the ani, drawing him into his net. So the word chaleka here is um, contrasted or used in the same place as the ani. The ani is a description of the chaleka, and it, it ch chops and changes back and forth throughout Psalm 10. And he crouches, he lies low, and the chaleka fall under his strength. He has said in his heart, Ale is forgotten, he has hidden his face, he shall never see. Arise, O Yehovah, O Ale, lift up your hand, do not forget the Ani. Why do the wrong scorn Elohim? He has said in his heart, It's not required. You have seen it, for you observe trouble and grief to repay with your hand. The chaleka commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Again, this idea of helping those who do not have anyone to help. And these are the people who are dark, who are poor, hapless people, unfortunate people. That's why I use this image, okay? This is actually the woman who was an actress in The Shining. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that she's got enough money she did an interview where she was talking about her struggle with mental health. And you see people like this. You know, you see people who are bedraggled, who are, you know, they're, maybe they're dirty, maybe they're smelly people. They can't look after themselves properly. I'm not saying this woman's dirty or smelly. I'm just saying that this is the kind of, when I was searching for images that fit in, I found this image. And, you know, obviously this woman is troubled. She's afflicted. She's hapless. She's... Uh, desperate. She's unfortunate. And these are the people that Yehovah has a heart for. Okay, you think of 
people like this, I mean, he's in a desperate position. He's an unfortunate person. And this person is also Evyon. He is also needy. Hey, someone like this. But these are the people who Yehovah has got a real heart for. It's not just people who don't have much stuff. Leviticus 19, 9-10 says, And when you reap the harvest of your land, do not completely reap the harvest of your field, corners of your field, or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not glean your vineyard or gather every grape of your vineyard. Leave them for the ani and the stranger. I am Yehovah, your Elohim. Okay, so it puts it in an entirely different light, doesn't it? It was saying, save this for the needy in the seventh year. But here it's saying, don't when you gather the harvest in a normal year, okay, save it for the ani, for the afflicted, for those who are unfortunate and the stranger, you know, the real vulnerable in society, they're the people that it's for. And there's going to be crossover in these categories. You're going to have ani who are also evyon and people who are in categories of the other words that we'll look at. And there is crossover in these categories, but we get so much more of an idea of who Yehovah is and what his heart is actually for when we understand the words that he uses. Exodus 22, uh, 22 to 23, you remember that Ani came from the verb Ana, which is to afflict. It's saying here, do not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you do afflict them at all, if they cry out to me at all, I shall certainly hear their cry. So essentially what it's saying is, don't make anyone who is a widow or a fatherless child one of the Ani. Don't add to their lot in life. Proverbs 31.20 says, this is talking about, uh, you know, people talk about the Proverbs 31 wife. Okay, this is really, it's a good description of the people who Yehovah is looking for as his bride. She has extended her hand to the Ani. Okay, we just read that she's extended her hand to the poor and we think, well, the needy ones, the people who've got stuff. No, the, the bride doesn't. The bride extends her hand to the Ani. As I say, the Ani is going to encompass the Avion sometimes, but these are the people that the bride extends her hands to, and she extends her hands to the Avion. Proverbs 3.34 says, He certainly scoffs the scoffers, but gives favor to the Ani. <coughs> this is Yehovah. In Psalm 69, which is a psalm written by David, he says, But I am Ani and sorrowful. So we see that you know, David was the king. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't needy in the sense that uh, needy means in a lot of the other scriptures, but he, he describes himself as a knee. In the next scripture, we'll see that he describes himself as a knee and ivyon. So these terms are also things that can be of spirit as well, a knee of spirit or ivyon of spirit. Psalm 109, 21 to 26 says, But you, O Yehovah, Master, deal with me for your namesake, because your kindness is good. Deliver me. So David goes to him and says, Do what is right in your eyes. Deliver me for your namesake. He knows that he can rely on him and call out to him for this. For I am a knee and a viewing, and my heart is pierced within me. I have gone like a lengthening shadow. I have been driven away like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting and my flesh grows lean from fatness. And I, I have become a reproach to them. They see me and they shake their heads. So we see this again. The Evyon are those who are looked down on, those who are browbeaten. Help me, O Yehovah, my Elohim. Save me according to your kindness. First Samuel 2 verse 8 says, He raises the Ani from the dust. He lifts the Avion from the dunghill to sit with princes and make them inherit the throne of esteem for the supports of the earth belong to Yehovah and he has set the world upon them. Okay, so the Ani, he, he takes them from the position that they're in where people look down upon them and they're nothing to people. He raises them up from the dust and he sets them with his inheritance to inherit his inheritance. The same with the Avion. Proverbs 14, 21 says, He who despises his neighbor sins, but he who shows favor to the ani, to the desperate, to the unfortunate, blessed is he. Isaiah 58, 67 is a passage of scripture that a couple of weeks ago I was going to include. It might have been two or four weeks ago I was going to include and I was going to speak about it because when I read it, it struck me what it was saying 
I never want to be somebody who comes to Scripture, finds something in Scripture, and says, I'm not prepared to do that. But what I came across in Isaiah 58, I was like, wow, that's, that's difficult. That's difficult. I can't see how that works out in my life. You know, I don't know where to fit those things into my life. But I did, obviously didn't want to come across it and be like, no, I, I do enough righteousness. When scripture tells me to do something, then if I'm not quite comfortable with it, I won't do it. So I was really kind of struggling with it. And then the week after, Charlie mentioned it in his Torah portion. He didn't speak about the particular thing. But I was thinking, well, maybe I wasn't supposed to speak on this because I omitted it. Because Charlie was going to speak on it. I uh, spoke to him about it last week. But through this, through the study of the Ani and the other words surrounding the poor, I've got greater understanding of what's actually required of us. It says, is this not the fast that I have chosen <coughs> to loosen the tight cords of wrongness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to exempt the oppressed, to break off every yoke? And you can see kind of this is language that would be associated with the Ani. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? I was thinking, I just don't know that I can make that a part of my life. I bring to my house the poor who are cast out and I just uh, go down to Birkenhead and find anybody who is needy and say, come, <laughs> come with me, all of you, come in the car and you can come and stay in my house. I was thinking, I just don't know how that actually works out. So I thought, I'm going to have to understand this scripture. I prayed about it for understanding. And through this, I can understand this better. It says, when you see the naked and cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh, which is the bit that really got me, because when I was like, I'm not sure that I, I'm going to do that. I'm not sure that I'm going to go and gather all of the poor and bring them home. I thought, am I just hiding myself from my own flesh? It's my flesh that doesn't want to do that. Am I hiding myself? So I, I was struggling with it. I was thinking, I'd, I'd just, I just, I don't know. But we know who the Ani are. The word for those who are cast out is marud. Uh, it's outlined in biblical usage is restlessness, straying, wanderer, or refugee. But that's not what it means. We've got to bear in mind when we look at the outline in biblical usage, that's just how it's used in whatever translation You've got the strongs numbers for. Okay, the definitions are better. We see that it comes from this root word in the sense of maltreatment. Okay, those who are mistreated. It's uh, in the sense of maltreatment, it's an outcast. Uh, abstractly, it's destitution, cast out, uh, or misery. Okay, so it's those who are kind of maltreated. And you think of who the Ani are, the Ani are the uh, desperate, the destitute, the unfortunate who are maltreated. So when I think about this scripture, bring the Ani who are marooned to your house, I think that makes so much more sense. Because I'm not just going to go out onto the street and encounter all these poor people and be like, back to mine, everybody, you can stay there. But if you encounter somebody who is desperate, who's unfortunate, who's maltreated by the world, who's just in this desperate position, I can absolutely appreciate you bring them home and be like, you can come and stay with me and I'll, I'll help you out of this situation that you're in. Completely changes what it's saying. In Matthew 5 verse 3, uh, Yeshua said, blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So obviously as I'm going through this and I'm thinking about all these different words for uh, poor, I'm thinking, well, which one did Yeshua use in this circumstance? And I've not come to a, a solid conclusion on it. When you take the Greek back to the Hebrew and look at what it is in the uh, Septuagint, it doesn't yield any fruit. Well, blessed are the poor in spirit. And this is the only thing I could tie it to and again, don't take this as truth. I'm sharing literally a thought that I had. In Leviticus 16 and 29, it says, And this shall be uh, for you a law forever in the seventh month and the tenth day of the month to afflict your souls. We know that the soul and spirit are bound up and that there are verses that use them interchangeably. Okay, Afflict your souls is those who are not your souls. And it makes sense to me that those who are poor in spirit 
are the ani kind of makes sense, but this is the only tiny thing that I can pin it on. Wouldn't put any hope in that at all. I'll just share it with you because it was a thought that I had. The other word that's used for poor, or one of the other words, is dal. Okay, and dal is another adjective. It's another description of something. The biblical usage says low, poor, weak, thin, one who is low, and that's pretty good. Definitions say that it is properly dangling. That's kind of what it means. It's from something that is dangling. By implication, something that is weak or thin. And from the context that we see, low is uh, probably the best that we've got in English. Often we cannot translate the Hebrew into English. To translate a word properly, we would have to translate a description of it, like the ani. How, how long has it taken me to go through what the ani are? Um, we need the description often, but I think low um, is pretty good when we look at the things that it's contrasted with. Leviticus 19.15 says, Do no unrighteousness in judgment. Do not be partial to the Tao or favor the face of the great. So it's not really the poor and the great. It's the low and the great. That's how it's contrasted. Jeremiah 5.1-5 to says, Diligently search the streets of Jerusalem and please look and know and see if uh, see in their open places if you find a man if there are, is anyone doing judgment seeking truth then I shall pardon her pardon Jerusalem even when they say as Jehovah lives they swear falsely for certain O Jehovah are your eyes not on truth you have smitten them but they have uh, they have not grieved. You've consumed them, but they have refused to receive instruction. They made their faces harder than rock. They refused to make Teshuvah to turn back. Then I said, these are only the Dal. They have been foolish, for they have not known the way of Yehovah, the judgment of their Elohim. Let me go to the great men, to the Gadol. Let me go to the Gadol and speak to them. So again, we've got the poor, the Dal, the low, contrasted with the great Okay, so it's not poor as we would think of it. Dal, the ones who are low, are almost certainly going to be avion as well. They're almost certainly going to be needy. But that's not actually strictly what this word means. Uh, Exodus 30 verse 15 says the rich, and the word for rich is ashir, and we'll look at that, does not give more. The dal does not give less. So here we have the rich being contrasted with the Dal, but it's not because the rich and poor are the uh, contrast to be made. It's those who are great by virtue of their wealth. That's why they're contrasted with the Dal. And we miss that entirely if we miss what Dal actually means. So it's those who are great by virtue of their wealth. We see a similar thing in Ruth 10, uh, 3 verse 10. He said, Blessed are you, O Yehovah, my daughter, you have, for you have shown me kindness at the, more kindness at the end than at the beginning, not to go after young men, whether dal or rich, ashir. So it's, it's contrasted here again, but it's those who are great, the poor, uh, the low, and the great, those who are great by virtue of their riches, because there are not very many words that are translated as rich. It's kind of just those who are rich. So you've got um, those contrasted with them. Interestingly, the ani is never contrasted with the ashir because there is no contrast to be made there. Somebody can be very rich, but still be one of the ani. Leviticus 14.21 says, but if he is dal and his hand is not reaching these things, okay, so this is talking about the cleansing of one with zarat. Usually they'd have to bring uh, a male uh, and a ewe lamb. This is saying, if, his, if he is low and his hand is not reaching, which is literally what it says in the Hebrew, although you might get a different translation, you miss it if, you know, you, you can get what it's talking about when it's saying, if they're low and their hand is not reaching, that makes sense if you understand that it's low, then he'll take and he brings a different offering. Judges 16 15 says, and he said to him, O oh, Yehovah, <coughs> with what do I save Yisrael? See, my clan is dal in Manasseh, weak. Yeah, not really, better for us to understand it, low. Low in Manasseh, we are of low stature. 
and I am the least in my father's house. So the clan is low, and I am the least in the clan. Second Samuel 3 verse 1 says, But the fighting <coughs> between the house of Shaul and the house of David was long drawn out, but David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Shaul grew Dala and Dala. Now, when it's contrasted with strong, you can understand why they translate it as weak, but really it's not. Okay, these people are great by virtue of their strength. So it's the low contrasted with the great by virtue of their strength. Again, you miss the opportunity to understand these things, though, if we don't know the words. Proverbs 22, 22 says, Do not rob the Tao because he is Tao. Do not rob the low because they are low. And, afflict, and oppress not the ani at the gate. You see how these things are getting a, a much greater breadth of meaning now. Job 34, 27 to 28 says, Because they turned from following him, and they regarded not uh, all his ways, so as to cause the cry of the low to come to him, for he hears the cry of the ani. So we see that there is crossover between these things. Okay, some people are going to be low by virtue of the fact that they are a knee. Okay, so this word is the word dala. You'll often see this. It comes from dal. But instead of being an adjective to describe what is dal, it is a noun, and it's a collective noun. So when you describe a collection of things by a name, that's a collective noun. Okay? And the collective noun speaks of the poor. So if you speak of the poor or the low, that's what dala is. So sometimes when you come across the word poor and you look what it means, you're going to get dala. And this is how it's different from dal. It's a noun to describe the collection of things which are dal. Again, it comes from the same root, something that is dangling. Job 34 verse 19 says, Who is not partial to princes nor regards the rich? The word for rich here is shoah. And I want to show you this so you can see the contrast with more than the dal, the low. Okay, so again we miss, if we don't have the Hebrew, that the rich is not the ashir here. It's the shoah. And the shoah, in this case, is an adjective um, and here in the original sense of freedom, a noble, i.e. liberal, opulent. Okay, so this is what it's saying. It's contrasting the low with those who are opulent or live in liberty. Okay, so you can see it's not just the rich and the poor, as we have in the English. Okay, the rich, the shoah, those who are at liberty, and those who are low in society. Proverbs 10 verse 15 says, The rich, the Ashir, man's sufficiency is his strong city. So this is going to criticize both the rich and the low here. So it's saying the problem with the rich is that their sufficiency is the thing that they put their trust in. The problem with the low is that their terror is their poverty. Okay, neither of them are trusting in Yehovah and looking beyond their circumstances. They look to their circumstances and that is what they put trust in or are put into terror uh, by. And this word reish here is um, a noun. Okay, so this, again, you've got the verb, which is what the thing does, and then you've got the noun, which is the name for the things that do the thing. And the noun is poverty. We can speak of poverty and that is a noun. It comes from this word, though. This is the verb root. This is rush. Okay? Rush is a verb. And I include this for completeness and also because we can understand something about Hebrew with it. Okay? And the verb is to be destitute, to be in lack, or to be needy. Okay? So that's what the verb is. That's what you're doing. You're being destitute, lacking or needy if you're doing this verb. There's another verb in Hebrew which is often translated as poor, which is muk. Okay, this is a verb and it means uh, literally to become thin or uh, figuratively, when it's used figuratively, it means to become impoverished. We see this in Leviticus 25.25. 25. It says, when your brother becomes poor, when your brother mooks, 
Okay, that's what he's doing. He's mooking. He's becoming poor. So this is where we see a word for poor used as a verb. We see the word rush used as a verb when it says young lions have lacked. Okay, young lions have rushed. The thing with the word rush is, and this is important for when, if you're coming through the scriptures and you go into a word and you're like, well, what is it? Is it an adjective to describe being poor? Is it a verb describing how you are poor? Or, uh, you know, is it a noun? We see rush is a verb. It means to be destitute. So usually when we would see this word, we would expect it to be used as uh, a verb. However, in this exception, it can mean poor man, which is a noun. Okay, Rush is used as a noun here. And that's because of these letters here, the subst. It means it's a substantive, which means a verb, which can be used as an adjective or as a noun. In this case, it's being used as a noun. Now, it depends on the language. But when you come across the word rush and you're like, it's a verb, how does it being a verb fit into this sentence? In this case, it is used as a noun, even though it's a verb. So we see 1 Samuel 18, 23, the servants of Shaul spoke those words in the hearing of David. And David said, does it seem to you a small matter to be a, king, to, to be a king's son-in-law seeing I am a rush? He's saying, seeing I am a verb, but it's not in this case, it's the noun, seeing I am a poor man. Proverbs 13, 23 says, much food is in the terrible ground of the rashim. Okay, we would be familiar with seeing a verb with, made into a plural, and then that is ones who do that verb. So in this case, when it's made a plural, okay, it is those who do that thing. But in this case, even when it's singular, as the verb on its own, it can be a poor man. This is saying, look, basically the poor have got loads, loads of opportunity in their tillable ground available to them. Psalm 82 verse 3 says, Give judgment to the low and the fatherless. Do right to the um, unfortunate or the, the desperate and needy. The word being rush here. Okay, so we've got three words that are described, that are translated as poor, dal, ani, and rush. We can't say poor, 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 so it's got to come up with something else. But now that we understand these words, we can look to see what's going on. An interesting word that's only used by Solomon is this word, mikin. Mikin is an adjective. It's a description. It comes from this word, which is sikluth, which has to do with folly or foolishness, okay? So Solomon says, a, a mickin and wise youth is better than an old and foolish king who no longer knows how to take warning. Okay, so mickin doesn't have to do with foolishness. It has to do with something that is not foolish, something that is wise. So a mickin Better than an old and foolish king because the old and foolish king no longer uh, changes. Ecclesiastes 9, 15 to 16 says, and, it was and there was found in it a micken, and by his wisdom he delivered the city, yet no one remembered that micken. And I said, wisdom is better than might, but the wisdom of, uh, but the, wisdom of the micken is despised, and his words are not heeded. So this is a wise and poor man. So if you come across poor man, you look at what the word means. If it's Micken, it's Solomon, and he's describing somebody who has wisdom in their poverty but will not be listened to because of their uh, status. Okay, the word Masor. Okay, this is a noun again. If you remember, poverty is a noun. Masor is used, and it means a need, a thing needed, lack, want, need, poverty. Sometimes you'll get it translated as poor, though, so this is what it means. Proverbs 11.24 says, and this is really, really interesting to me, there is one who scatters yet increases more, and one who withholds more than is right, but it comes to masor, it comes to poverty. That's fascinating to me. I think that kind of people's probably standard reaction to this is, go, is to go, well, okay, I'm going to define what withholding more than is right is I don't withhold more than is right I, I withhold just the right amount and that's what's right missing the beautiful uh, lesson from the scripture that if you scatter everything 
then you will increase more and Yehovah will increase you more. But if you hold on to things and you don't give to others, then that tends to poverty. Okay, so the word for the rich is the ashir. It's an adjective or a noun. Adjective means to be rich, to be wealthy, the description of something that is rich or wealthy. And the noun means the rich, the wealthy, or rich man. It comes from this verb. So this is what the adjective is describing, or the name is the thing that is doing. Okay, so it's a verb. It means to be or become rich or wealthy, to enrich, or interestingly, to pretend to be rich. And this is the word that is used most often in the scriptures when it says the rich. First Samuel 22 uh, to uh, verse 7 says, Yehovah makes poor, and the word there again isn't poor in any type, it means dispossesses. So by implication he makes more, he dispossesses and makes rich. He does that verb, he assures, he makes rich. Proverbs 10 verse 4 says, uh, poor is he who works with a lazy hand, but the hand of the hard worker makes rich. That's what the hand of the hard worker does. It does this verb, which is to make rich. Psalm 49 verse 2, okay, both sons, both sons of mankind, sons of the Ashir, and we can learn a lot from how it's contrasted. So we've got the rich contrasted with the Evion, which is kind of the understanding that we have of the rich and the poor. It's the traditional contrasting of the rich. We saw this before, the poor, the dull, the low, contrasted with those who are great by virtue of their riches. Those who are great by virtue of their riches contrasted with the dull. Those who are great again by virtue of their riches. Second Samuel 12, 1 Samuel 12.1 contrasts the Ashir with the other one that we heard about, the poor. Again, the more traditional way that we think of these things. Okay, the rich, as we saw, the different word for rich contrasted with the low. So all the way through scripture, you'll see these things being contrasted, the rich and the poor. But it's so much deeper with so much more depth than how we read these scriptures and what they mean. Now, Genesis 13, 2, and we'll come to an end of these words here. But Avram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Okay, so Avram was very rich, but Avram was not a sheer. And this is a fantastic example of how understanding the Hebrew tells us so much more about what's going on here. Avram was very kavad. And kavad is actually the word that's used uh, when Yehovah um, makes Pharaoh's heart heavy. When he strengthens his heart, it's often translated. So it's a verb. So it's not, it's not an adjective. It's not Abraham was very rich, a description of who he was. It's an adjective. And it's to be heavy, to be weighty, uh, to be rich is how it's used in the Bible. But be honorable or honored, heavy with you know, the, the sense of the honor that is on Abraham was that it, it was weighty and he was very much of this. So where his riches came from was the fact that he was very honored by Yehovah. He wasn't just, you know, with loads of money. So now we can understand as we read through uh, Deuteronomy 15 what is actually being said. <coughs> so it says, Only there should be no avion among you, for Yehovah does greatly bless you in the land which Yehovah Elohim is giving you to possess as an inheritance. Shouldn't be anyone needy in the land because Yehovah is going to bless you. 